Hey everyone, welcome to BCP Med. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at intramolecular nucleophilic substitutions, a special subset of SN1 and SN2 process that occur with the leaving group and the nucleophile in the same molecule. These result in heterocyclic ring closures, which can produce anything from a triangular species like an epoxide all the way to the hexagonal species uh, and cy like cyclohexane derivatives that we're familiar with in organic chemistry. Let's go ahead and get started. The first thing I want to go ahead and go over are what the usual suspects are for intramolecular substitutions. Our nucleophiles are typically going to be alcohols and amines, which will occur either through SN1 or SN2 processes. Thiols and phosphines, which are period 3 analogs of alcohols and amines, are also capable of performing intramolecular nucleophilic substitution. They're just a little bit less common because thiols and phosphines are less common than alcohols and amines. Typically, when we work intramolecularly, halides are the common leaving group. It is possible to have other leaving groups. However, uh, halogens are common because they are not nucleophilic and are only acting as a leaving group, whereas alcohols can be both. But in this case, alcohols are the, typically the nucleophile. So in terms of alcohols as nucleophiles, there's two ways the alcohol can act as a nucleophile. If you're under basic conditions, like in aqueous sodium hydroxide, for example, the alcohol is going to favor an SN2 process, typically. Why is that the case? Well, once the alcohol is deprotonated, it becomes O-, which is a very strong nucleophile, and that can go ahead and directly attack the halide leaving group. Conversely, if we're under neutral or acidic conditions, we're probably going to favor SN1 because the alcohol will not be activated as a nucleophile. OH is a weak nucleophile and needs to wait for the cation to form. Conversely, amines tend to directly favor SN2 because the lone pair is available enough to just directly attack that antibonding orbital. Now, the relative position of the nucleophile in the leaving group in the carbon chain is going to determine the size of the ring and the rate and how much of the ring is formed. Right? There is an equilibrium between the closed form ring and the open straight chain form in the intra, uh, intramolecular nucleophilic substitution. I also want to go ahead and point out that the regular restrictions for SN1 and SN2 apply. So you're never going to do an SN2 reaction on a tertiary leaving group, even if it's intramolecular. Let's go ahead and look at some examples of what internal SN2 and SN1 reactions might look like. For example, consider this alcohol, which also has a halogen attached towards the opposite end. In this case, we want to be able to identify which is our leaving group, and that is going to typically be the halogen. Conversely, our internal nucleophile is going to be the OH. So anytime you see a molecule that has both an OH or an amine on the same carbon chain as a chlorine or another halogen, you want to think about the possibility of an internal SN1 and SN2. These are often asked as exam questions because they force you to think about the things you know of SN1 and SN2, but in a context you aren't familiar with, namely intramolecularly. The SN2 goes through the same transition and has the same exact inversion characteristics for stereochemistry, but now the rate is going to be unimolecular. The nucleophile is part of the R leaving group, and so instead of having a separate uh, concentration for the nucleophile, the rate is only based on the concentration of the nucleophile and the leaving group. Um, Typically, what will happen in an SN2 is you must first activate the alcohol, so you can affect that by treating the alcohol with something like sodium hydride, which is a very strong base but not nucleophilic, to get the corresponding o alkoxide, or the O-. Once that's formed, the O- can go ahead and attack the leaving group from the back and perform an SN2 reaction to close the ring. You notice that the product of this is a heterocyclic ring where the oxygen, or the other heterocyclic nucleophile, probably nitrogen, is actually incorporated into the ring. A similar thing can happen through an SN1 process. It has the same substitution requirements as normal SN1, so secondary and tertiary species are okay, primary is not, and the rate dependence and the on the leaving group is the same, and the racemization of the stereocenter is also the same. So in this case, you have the chlorine now on a secondary uh, carbon as opposed to a primary, so SN1 is possible. The chlorine leaves, forming the carbocation, and then our weak OH nucleophile can go ahead and attack the cation. This forms a protonated OH intermediate, which is then deprotonated by the resulting chloride to give the final product. Note, again, we have a heterocyclic ring closure, 
where the oxygen is in the ring. In this case, we have an extra methyl group because that was needed to give a sufficiently stable cation. Now, there are two major considerations for the formation of a ring. One is entropic and the other is enthalpic. Entropic considerations have to do with probability. That is to say, ring closure is partially governed by how likely the ring is, or rather how likely the nucleophile is to actually find that leaving group. If the chain is very, very long and the nucleophile is very far away, it's unlikely that the nucleophile is able to find the leaving group with any sort of frequency. As a result, fewer carbons between the nucleophile and the leaving group means there's less degrees of rotational freedom, right? Single bonds rotate. And so for every single bond between the two that is present, um, there's a degree of rotational freedom, which means that the nucleophile and the leaving group might be rotated to be far apart from one another. So the more carbons there are, or rather the fewer carbons there are in the chain between the nucleophile and leaving group, the more likely the species are to react. So for example, if we only have two carbons, which is the least we can have between the nucleophile O- and the leaving group Cl, we form a triangular ring, this epoxide here, which is the smallest ring we can form, and it is the most entropically or probabilistically favored because there's only one degree of rotational freedom. Either the chlorine is syn in the same orientation as the oxygen, in which case it doesn't react, or it is anti to the oxygen, in which case it does react via SN2. When we think about bigger rings, like four or five membered rings forming, the bigger the ring is, the less likely it is to form because there's more degrees of rotational freedom. So in the case of the four-membered ring, we have two single bonds which can rotate, but there's only one conformation in which case the ring closure is favored. Uh, in the case of the five-membered ring, there's three single bonds, but again, only one of those conformations actually allows the nucleophile to attack the backside of the chlorine. Remember, the transition state requirements remain for SN2, so the nucleophile has to be close enough and in the proper orientation to actually attack that backside orbital. If the, ring is if the straight chain is flopping all over the place and rotating in 3D space, the more it does that, the less likely the nucleophile is to find the leaving group. Finally, in the case of a hexagonal ring or a six-membered ring, we're the least likely for the ring to close. And so in terms of probability, the smallest rings are actually favored, even though they have ring strain, which is a bit counterintuitive. The other major consideration is enthalpic, that is, the energy considerations associated with ring closure. This has to do with the strain on the resulting ring. Smaller rings have more bond angle strain and more steric or torsional strain than do larger rings, so they are more unstable. If we go ahead and look at our ring closure chart again, we find that the closure of the three-membered ring is actually going to be the most thermodynamically disfavored because of the strain associated with those 60 degree bond angles, right? Typically the bond angle for carbon carbon bonds or carbon or sp3 carbon bonds rather is 109 degrees. And in this case, we're straining it all the way to 60. Sometimes this is known as a banana bond because the overlap is so bad due to the strain that it's not a true single bond. Conversely, the six-membered ring is optimal in terms of bond strain and steric torsion. Five-membered rings are also quite good at this. So which of these two factors, entropy or enthalpy, wins out in the closure has to do on an individual compound. And some compounds have the option to close rings at multiple sites, and you'll see a mix of products based on which one is more favored for that given compound and the other extraneous conditions like solvent, um, acidity of the solution, and molecular weights and other effects like that. A very important thing we need to address for intramolecular nucleophilic substitutions is the fact that transition state requirements remain for SN2, and they are very selective in, al in allowing intramolecular substitutions. For example, let's go ahead and compare these three compounds. Right? Of these three, if we were to go ahead and treat them with terp butoxide, which is a strong base, we can imagine that we would deprotonate the OH. The OH is then adjacent to a leaving group, right? So we can imagine that we could close a three-membered ring by kicking out the chlorine through an SN2 reaction. However, when we do this experimentally, we find that only the middle compound actually reacts to form the epoxide. The other two do not react. Why is that the case? 
Well, let's go ahead and remind ourselves of the transition state requirements for SN2. The nucleophile must attack the carbon from the backside of the leaving group in order to uh, donate its electron density into that antibonding orbital and actually break the leaving group bond. If it cannot access that confirmation, if the nucleophile cannot get to the back, it cannot do an SN2 reaction. So let's look at how the middle reaction does actually occur. In the trans ring that we have here, where the OH and the CL are trans to one another, they're in opposite stereochemical configurations, the chair for the cyclohexane has two possible orientations. One of them is known as the transaxial configuration, in which case both the O and the CL are axial and are anti to one another. So the O can then, in this case, directly access the backside of that chlorine orbital and attack, forming the epoxide. This is how the uh, intramolecular SN2 functions. However, the flipped chair, the one where the uh, axial equatorial positions are flipped, does not actually react, right? The O, in this case, where it's equatorial, cannot access the back of the equatorial chlorine. And so the, the trans-equatorial chair is actually not reactive to SN2, only the transaxial chair. You can imagine that because only one of the chair forms is reactive to SN2, this reaction is going to be a bit slower than normal intramolecular SN2s, since only those chairs in this configuration are actually able to um, react, and especially because this involves both groups being axial, which is somewhat disfavored, and so this chair form is not as dominant as this chair form. However, it's not impossible for this to occur, and the reaction does proceed. Conversely, if we go ahead and look at the cis species, where the O and the Cl are cis to one another, this always results in one of the groups being axial and the other one being equatorial. When this is the case, the oxygen can never find the backside of the chlorine orbital. Because either the chlorine is equatorial and the oxygen axial, or vice versa, the O can never find the backside of this orbital, and the SN2 process is completely hindered. This does not react, which is why you do not form the epoxide from the cis species. The terpedal case is pretty interesting, because you might say to yourself, well, we have the trans species, what's going on? Why doesn't this form the epoxide? Well, consider the configuration in which case this terpedal species would need to access for the SN2. It needs to access the transaxial configuration. However, in this chair form, the terpedal group is trans to the OH and is down. It is axial in this configuration. An axial terpedal group is extremely unstable, and so this chair form really does not exist very much in the reaction mixture. And so, it usually exists in this trans-equatorial form, which is far more stable. Because this form is so much more stable, um, this form predominates, but it is not reactive towards SN2. The O- cannot attack the chlorine in this configuration. So, while the groups are in the proper stereochemical orientation to react, because of this terpedal group, conformationally, this chair predominates and inhibits the reaction from ever occurring. And so this species does not react very well for SN2. Another issue that we might consider in terms of uh, SN2 restrictions or even SN1 restrictions has to do with conformational rigidity associated with multiple bonds or pi bonds. Conformational rigidity can help or actually hinder ring closure. Consider the following three species. They all have the same number of carbons between the nucleophile and the leaving group, however their outcomes are very different. In order for the ring to close for this first species, this straight single bonded chain, the, the single bonds need to rotate such that the amine is in a position to attack this leaving group from behind. In the case of the double bond though, this position is already achieved, right? These species are the same. This amine is already pre-positioned to attack the chlorine from behind. Conversely, if we look at the alkyne, this species cannot exist at all. This is far too strained because these um, alkyne carbons are sp hybridized, they have a linear geometry, and so they are always locked into this configuration. They cannot bend in this way to form this uh, precursor to the ring. As a result, this ring closure, 
forms this species here, where after rotating into the appropriate configuration, this nitrogen can attack. And this ring, already being in this configuration, can directly form this uh, cyclo, or I guess this would be a uh, this heterocyclic ring with a double bond in the middle, whereas this species doesn't react at all. This species, because it's already pre-positioned into the proper orientation, attacks faster than does this one, which has to rotate into the proper configuration. However, sometimes it exists in this configuration and is not reacting towards SN2. Last but not least, I want to go over a very prolific example on the impact of conformation to cyclization, and that has to do with terpene cyclization. Terpenes are a very prolific class of natural products which are produced by plants, animals, and fungi, and involve these uh, repeating isoprene units. However, in order for the uh, terpene to cyclis cyclicize, or cyclize rather, we need this alkene at the end to attack this uh, carbon with the pyrophosphate leaving group. Pyrophosphate is a very good leaving group, and so this is favored and in fact will typically proceed via an SN1 pathway. However, we still need that conformational access even though it's not SN2. The problem is that when we try to fold up the chain to access that better conformation, we're stuck. This trans alkene here keeps the leaving group carbon far away from our uh, nucleophilic alkene. And so trying to do the substitution here is very strongly disfavored. Some enzymes have actually evolved to do this by really straining that uh, straight chain, but generally it's not very likely. And in fact, nature has evolved a better way to make this happen. We can actually migrate the pyrophosphate leaving group to this carbon and migrate the double bond to this bond here. This gives us this species, where we now have a single bond at this position. This single bond is able to freely rotate, and we can rotate into this conformer here, where now we have this carbon much closer to the final alkene. We can then remigrate the pyrophosphate back to this position and remigrate the uh, double bond to this position. You might wonder how these migrations are happening, as that's something you probably haven't seen before. Enzymes use magnesium ions to help coordinate the pyrophosphate and help move the double bond back and forth. So this isn't just happening completely on its own, the enzyme is actually pushing it along. In any case, now that we're in the proper conformation, where the carbon of the leaving group is right next to this nucleophilic double bond, we can very easily perform the nucleophilic substitution. Again, because pyrophosphate is a good leaving group, this actually happens via an SN1 pathway. Uh, however, because it's occurring in the enzyme, often we draw it concertedly, even though it's SN1. This results in the following cation being formed. It is cyclized with a new bond being formed between these two carbons right here, right? New bond is formed right there. And because the alkene is the nucleophile, we form a carbocation at this position because we're losing electron density when that happens. But this just goes to show you that conformation, whether an alkene is cis or trans, can really strongly impact the ability of a molecule to cyclize. And with that, we've actually reached the end of the content for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. And if you enjoyed what you saw, please like and subscribe to the channel. If you want to learn more, check out our other videos in the chemistry playlist. And if you're looking to branch out, check out our other science playlists as well. Thank you so much for watching and see you next time.